Hey everybody, welcome to this week's roundup. I'm recording these much later than I normally would, so if I don't seem as enthusiastic as normal or if I'm a little loopy, I don't mean any offense to any of the stuff I'm talking about. I'm still super pumped to talk about all of the awesome stuff that's been happening this week. Just, you know, sometimes you get tired. But anyway, let's jump in and see what we got. First up is a mini review of a game I just purchased, Life on Mars, which was advertised as the first Metroidvania for the Sega Genesis. And I'm going to have some technical stuff and then I'm going to kind of give my thoughts on it. But please just stay for 30 seconds and then skip if you don't want to hear my review. I don't normally do game reviews, but I just kind of want to talk about this one. But please don't let me waste your time. So the stuff that you need to know, um, this is a cartridge only game. They are not selling the ROM at all, which I have some thoughts about, obviously. Uh, but also everything does seem to be in good working order. It comes with some artwork. It comes with a manual that is not the same uh, size as a normal Genesis manual, which is kind of weird, but everything else looks completely intact. The case looks exactly, I got the Mega Drive version. It looks like it fits right on my shelf next to the rest of them. And most importantly, the cartridge seems to be good quality. The edges were beveled and chamfered, and I believe those are level shifters on there to make it the correct voltage. So while I, I can't do a perfect deep dive review of how this all works, I can say that my biggest pet peeve is games that aren't beveled because then you'll smash the pins of your console and really shorten the life of it. This is beveled and it is safe to use. Also, very quickly, if you want a much more balanced and you know happy video review, please check on check out on a retro trips video. And I think that's probably a much better review than what I'm about to do. But I do want to share my thoughts. So once again, please skip to the next section if you don't care. I don't want to waste anybody's time, but let's just kind of go through everything. Um, first and foremost, I was wrong when I first promoted this game and thought it was a game exclusively made for the Sega Genesis, but it was actually made originally for the MSX and the developer just ported it over. So that's not a bad thing, but I definitely got that fact wrong. I think, to be honest, I just saw Genesis, Metroidvania, and went, I'm in, because it's my favorite style of game. And also, that might be why I'm so picky about this, is because it was my favorite style of game. I was... I kind of had high expectations for it. So a lot of this stuff feels like a port. Now, once again, it's the developer's own game. So it's not like they just ported somebody else's game. Uh, but I, I don't think it feels like a game made for the Genesis. And I will explain why. First up, though, uh, the very first thing that happened when I plugged the cartridge in was I accidentally hit continue instead of new game and the game crashed. So I immediately emailed the creator because I thought, well, all right, am I going to get halfway through the game and it's going to lose my save because of this? And here's what they had to say. It is 100% safe to play the game. They disabled the routine to check if there was a previously saved game or not in order to solve a bug. And after solving it, they forgot to re-enable the check. The error occurs because it's loading corrupted save data that causes the game engine to do things that it's not programmed to do. It's totally harmless, and once you save, once you reach a save station, you'll never see that error again. Well, they were correct. I never did see an error again. All of my saves did work, but, I mean, that's just a really bad first impression. They didn't do a QA check to test the basic title screen. And the other thing about the save games is your two choices, new game or continue. Continue, there's only one slot, and it's not even a slot. You just hit continue, and you pick up where you left off. So what would have happened if I hit new game in the middle of my, you know, middle of my run here? So I didn't try it because I just, I, I might still go back and finish the game, but that seems pretty dangerous. And Metroidvanias are supposed to have that, you know, multi-slot title screen for many reasons, including you don't accidentally start a new game and overwrite your older one. Also, once after saving, the sound just stopped working. And if there weren't other bugs, I probably wouldn't have mentioned that at all. Uh, and of all the bugs to have, I mean, you save your game, the sound stopped working. So you power cycle and you start out right where you left off. So it's <laughs> of all the bugs to have, I mean, that's nothing. That's not, not at all an issue, but it's worth mentioning just in the context of everything else. Also, some enemies didn't seem to take hits when they were right in front of you. You had to be a step away, which if that's an artistic choice, fine, but that drove me crazy because I'm smashing away at some enemies and as soon as they get too close, I wasn't doing damage. So that that kind of bugged me right away. And, you know, hit detection is kind of crucial to any video game. So if that was their choice, 
fine, cool, but I mean, it just didn't really make sense. Also, one of the bosses, I think it looked like a tree or something. I think it just glitched out and disappeared when I died. Um, what could have happened is I fired a bullet and it fired a, project fired a projectile and we both died at the same time. And the game saves your progress even if you don't get to a save point. So maybe that was it. Maybe I beat the boss. Uh, I actually prefer that you have to go back and save at a save point. That way it really feels like you've earned it. But once again, that's just opinion. But I don't think I killed the boss. I think it had like half its energy left. And because I was under the mindset of like, all right, I got to find its pattern. Let's just hammer away at this thing, die as many times as I have to until I find the pattern. So I wasn't really trying too hard and I died. And then I went back to the room and it was gone. So I have to go back on a retro trip, said they were going to upload their full playthrough. So I need to go back and watch what they did and see what it, did I miss anything? Was there like a special weapon or something I could have gotten? Um, but that that seemed like a glitch. Once again, it could have just been we, we both killed each other at the same time and it auto saved. But that that didn't really feel right. Um, also, I found a glitch in the ceiling of one room that when you fall, you go back to the beginning of the room. Now, maybe that was intentional. Maybe that's a secret passage, but on a retro trip also found this secret area at the 830 mark in their video. And I was really hoping like, oh, cool, it's a Metroidvania. So it's a secret passage, maybe another weapon upgrade. And you just um, in in their video, if you would if they had just kept jumping and kind of wiggling the controller to go left a little more, you'd feel the character fall down and then that's it. You're back at the room. So bunch of that's you know five glitches right off right off the bat um also the controls didn't kind of feel right it kind of felt off and i think this is kind of the result of it being made for the msx and ported over to the genesis um some of the stuff like jumping didn't quite feel right also a, a kind of a big pet peeve is if you hit the up arrow you stop running and aim no matter what you're what you're doing there's no run and shoot so, or no run and aim diagonal and shoot. But while that in itself is kind of annoying, if you're using, uh, no matter what controller you're using, you have to double tap in order to run. Now, if it had very specific button mapping settings, or even if you had the ability to change, I could totally see that being, all right, if you have a three button controller, double tap to run, and if you have a six button, it's X or something, right? Um, but that's not what it was. It was always double tap to run, which meant if you're in a, a tight spot and you're running away from an enemy and you go to double tap, but you accidentally hit up, instead of running, you just freeze in your spot. Or if you're running away from an enemy and you're, you know, you're kind of excited and you accidentally hit it. So that, that was a control issue that kind of felt weird. Also, on the six button controller, Z, I believe, would immediately open the menu. And on both, start holding start for a few seconds opens the menu and tapping start changes your weapon so i actually thought that was pretty cool it, and a really good use of hey how could we jam more features into the three button controller except whenever you're in front of a save point if you uh, it's start to save so this is going to sound like a nitpick but if you've played the game you're going to immediately know what i'm saying on all of these other Metroidvania style games, you go to your save room or maybe you find a save station and it's press A to save. So you could jump onto the save platform, you hit A and then B to cancel or something like that. When this one, it's start and there's no cancel. So you're, you're frozen for a couple of seconds. So many times I'm learning, you know, I went to fight a boss, died, came out and then charge up and then I go to hit start to switch the special weapon and I'm frozen in spots my spot while I'm saving. So, and I guess there was a couple other times too. I was just walking through, didn't even realize the save spot. And I went to go, all right, I'm going to change my weapon because I'm in a new area, tapped start. And here I am just frozen while walking while it saves. So that does seem like a nitpick, but it's something that would have bugged you if you, if you kind of ran into it as well. Uh, so that's kind of one of those things that I think it, it just kind of shows you that it wasn't made for the Genesis because all Genesis Mega Drive games that were made later in their life had specific six button controls and often even the ability to change the controls to your liking and that's just not one of the options so that was kind of weird um also uh a few random things that are just my opinions um you know metroidvanias are my favorite style games and one of the things about the best metroidvanias are they have awesome soundtracks to suck you in 
And I was really hoping for an amazing soundtrack played on the Genesis audio trips, but it was more just atmospheric style music, which if that's the artistic choice, then you know what? whatever that's my opinion it's theirs it's their game so that's totally cool but that is something that disappointed me and also one thing that bugs me and has bugged me in a few recent games is one of my favorite things from metroidvanias is that by the time you get to the end of the game those rooms and sections that you walked through that were challenging at first now you're blasting through with tons of extra life and you know all these awesome weapon upgrades and that i didn't get that here you do get weapon upgrades and you can level up your pea shooter gun thing but the leveling up is so slow that you never feel the upgrade and it's never high enough where you could actually just use your main gun. I was using the special weapons all through the game and never, every time I tried to use the gun, I'm just going, well, what did I do that for? You know, it's, I get a couple of shots longer distance, but it's a much weaker weapon. So that was kind of a, a, a weird thing. And the only other thing that kind of bugged me is one of the bosses didn't seem to have a pattern. And on a retro trip also showed this in their video at 852. And I ended up just smashing through the enemy, hitting him with a bunch of my, you know, a bunch of special weapons and then smashing through again and just basically trying to give them as much damage as I could before I used all of my damage. So, so that's, that's basically it. Um, it's a game that I really, really wanted to like, but I think because my, my very first thing that happened was a bug that could have definitely been being caught. If, uh, if it had a better QA process, because I think they sold like a thousand of these. So, you know, maybe double and triple check the very basic stuff when you start the game out. Uh, and also, no ROM is just annoying, because I never buy physical copies of this, because I just don't have the room in order to keep all of these. But, you know, Metroidvania on the Genesis, I kind of took a, a leap here, but I, I'm never buying another game from them unless it's available on, on a ROM because I'm not, I mean, I wasted 75 bucks on this and I'm probably going to just give it to a friend, to be honest with you. And I got to say, I'm not talented enough to make a video game. If I tried, it would be garbage. And if you put this game out in 1993, it probably would be a game that we still talk about today. But it's not 1993. It's, you know, many, many years later. And there's a lot of other games that you could look at as to your inspiration. Uh, and you could kind of not had some of these bugs and you could have added a few more of these. So I think if I'd paid like 10 bucks for the ROM, I would have a much more positive opinion. And I would have emailed the creator and maybe the creator would have said, thanks for finding these bugs. Uh, these other five things are my choice. So screw you. It's my game. And that would have been totally cool. And you get your updated version of the ROM. But I think their stance of I refuse to release the ROM because I want to try to lower piracy. I don't know. I don't like it. Um, it's my, it's their game. They could do anything in the world they want with it, but I certainly, I'm not giving them, you know, 75 bucks of my money anymore, unless I could really, unless there's a cheaper choice or unless I have some way to play the game first. So maybe you'll love it. You know, one of the things I, you know, I'll end on this. How many times in your life have you heard a song where you're like, that song sucks. And then months later, one of your friends is like, Hey, check this out. And you listen and you're like, Oh, I love that song. Why did I not like that a few months ago? The song's amazing. Maybe that's this. Maybe I'll, you know, give this to a friend and then borrow it back in a couple of months and play it again and go, you know what? I was super grumpy. I shouldn't have had that attitude. I love the game now. I, I feel bad for giving it a mediocre review on the podcast, but it's definitely how I feel about it today. And I don't think I'm going to finish it. I don't have extra time to do any of this stuff. And the final part that I'm at, it's just basically like, here's a million enemies go through it. So you just got to, boringly and painstakingly without any patterns without any fun weapons and you just have to no, you know nothing to learn you're basically just going to smash your way through in one very long corridor type thing with no save in it so i just i feel like i feel like i'm done with this game so i don't know maybe i'm wrong hopefully you all like it this week's roundup is once again sponsored by JLC PCB, and this week we're going to continue showing the full build for the SCART Cleaner PCB Plus Assembly. And what I want to show this time is something I'd only showed once before, but how to use PCBs as a case or decoration or whatever else you want. So in the case of the SCART Cleaner, rather than make a fancy 3D printed case, which I still hope that somebody steps up and does, I just wanted some way to isolate the pins on the top and the bottom so you could leave it on your desk and not worry about shorting it out on the top of your metal PVM or something. So let's walk through the process of what that looks like and what to expect when you do that. 
So starting off is the same process as always. Go to jlcpcb.com, click on order now and upload the Gerber file. And after it's uploaded, for some reason, it's not showing anything in the preview window, but that's not a big deal. You just click on Gerber viewer, wait for it to load and you should be able to see what you got. And as you can see here, it is as basic as it gets. It is a PCB with no traces on it. It just has labels, it says SCART cleaner, low pass filter, and the, um, the sink stripper on and off. So you just know what it is that you're doing, but it is as basic as it gets. And when you're doing things like using PCBs as cases or decoration, there's not much to worry about other than aesthetics. You might worry about thickness. I don't, I leave it default. I did choose a different color, so you could choose whichever PCB that you might want with it. Um, for me personally, for the cases, I always go with just what I feel like in the moment, and I don't really have any green as prototype, because if it's a case, why not? And then of course, how many you want for the quantity. Then you just hit save to cart, and then of course we're gonna have to upload the bottom file as well, but there's not gonna be anything on this. So uh, you don't have to worry about labeling or orientation. And of course there's no traces on it or anything like that. So you would just select the same color that you would have selected before in the same quantity. And once again, it didn't show up in the preview window. So you would just have to hit the Gerber viewer. And as you can see, there's nothing here. It's just some mounting holes and a PCB for the bottom to protect the traces from being pushed down. So that's it, hit save to cart check out and that's it next up mr add-ons is now selling an nes to famicom controller adapter for just twelve dollars and fifty cents that works perfectly now props to pork uh, this was made exactly the way it should be uh, i highly recommend it i would call this a must buy for people that want to use nes controllers and the zapper on a famicom but with all the respect in the world you know this isn't magic Pork just made it right. And I've used a lot of these adapters over the years that were not made correctly. So I, I just want to be, be clear on both ends of that. This is a compliment, but there's also no, nothing magical going on here. So all of the compatibility issues that you would get from any properly built NES to Famicom adapter, such as it won't work with Super Mario USA. And when I used my older original EverDrive, uh, Famicom EverDrive, I couldn't use the NES controller in the menu. I had to use the Famicom's controller, but then the moment the game loaded, I plugged this in and used the NES controller with no problems. So, you know, this is one of those things that if you don't, if you've never gone through buying a bunch of these and had the zapper not work or have something just fail on you, then you might think that I'm making too big a deal of this. But if you, if you're like me and you've bought a few of these over the years and none really worked right, you'll understand why I'm so excited about it. Also, having it work with the zapper was absolutely awesome yes. and something that I, I just wanted to share. So I put that, you know, YouTube short style video. I didn't make this one a short, I think because I think those just really annoy people. But basically I did a little demo and I did show that without a doubt, Duck Hunt does work with this, uh, as do any NES Zapper games using an EverDrive on a Famicom. Should also work with Sharp Twin Famicom and everything else. So like I said, if you wanna use NES controllers on a Famicom, I'm gonna call this one a must buy. And if you want more info, check out that silly social media thing on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and yes, even TikTok. Developer Sebastian Stax has just released another open source project they're calling the Game Boy Interceptor, which imagine like a Game Genie-esque style device that plugs into your DMG Game Boy, then you plug your cartridge into it. However, this has a USB port on the side that if you plug it into your computer, it shows up as a standard webcam device, but it's sending the audio and video from your Game Boy to your computer. So if you're doing speed runs or streaming or anything else, you could use this device instead of trying to have a consoleized Game Boy. So if you want to use multiple different Game Boys or anything like that, this is definitely the device that you would want to use. Now, Alex did an absolutely awesome post summarizing everything on this. Uh, there's also uh, other videos directly showing it. And Cordy Moto is going to try to put together a batch of these on Tindy, probably around 50 bucks, give or take. Um, so all of this stuff is pretty exciting. I think that this is absolutely awesome. And if you're interested right now 
definitely check out Alex's post. Definitely check out the embedded videos. But hopefully I'll be talking to Sebastian on a podcast soon. So I, I don't want to spend too much time on this now because I want you to all come back and hear directly from Sebastian and we'll go a, a deep dive into this product. But, you know, if you just have to learn all of it about it right now, Alex got you covered and so is the, the video that's embedded in as well. But this is a neat and exciting project and I'd like to see stuff like this for other platforms as well. Uh, for a whole bunch of reasons, but I won't get into that now. I'll wait for the proper time to rant. Happy rant about this. Here is a very important PSA for people that just purchased and received the FX Pack Pro. Not bad news at all. It's just something that you need to know. But the latest version of the hardware is different enough that the current firmware that's out is not compatible with it. So Akari is working on a firmware that's gonna be compatible with all of them, including the latest. And it was really just a, a whole delay thing where the firmware got delayed just enough. So these things were arriving at people's homes before the new firmware got released. So all you have to do is just download the beta firmware and not the official firmware. And that's it, it'll start working. There's nothing else to do. There's also a bunch of cool things in this firmware, uh, like USB support, save, save state support, standalone save features, some compatibility improvements, Super Game Boy support, and a favorite games list. So these are things that have always kind of been floating around with alternative, or have been floating around with alternative firmwares for a while, but Akari is looking to roll this into an official full stable firmware. So my strong suggestion to you, unless you're a, a rebel that always wants to try the latest betas, if your FX pack is an original one or, or a previous version and it's working, maybe just leave it alone for now, unless you obviously want to try that extra stuff. If you have the latest hardware version and it doesn't work with the firmware that's on the main page, you, you have to use the beta. But as soon as that official firmware is released, we will update everybody and let everybody know. So not at all a bad thing, in my opinion. It's just one of those you need to know it. Otherwise, you'll think your FX pack is broken. But overall, still got nothing but good things to say about the product. And of course, Akari. I recently posted an interview with Brendan, aka B 64 k who's a YouTuber and a documentarian that mostly focuses on the Commodore 64, but also kind of branches out and does a bunch of other stuff as well. And it was a really fun chat. We get to kind of talk about him growing up in game as a gamer in South Africa and then moving to Canada. And of course, the Commodore 64, which I didn't really have much experience with. So I'm always very interested to hear people's stories, especially people with so much interest uh, and knowledge in that and of course we talked about the best different ways that you might want to experience commodore 64 now so overall if you want to hear uh, stories about cool international gaming or if you want to hear about the commodore 64 or you just like hearing two nerds talk definitely check out the interview uh, and if you don't care about any of those things you still might want to just check out brendan's channel and all of the very cool different videos that he's posted um and you know the very deep dive documentaries and other stuff that's on there. So it was a very fun chat. And I hope you enjoyed it. Now it's time for this week's Mr. Updates, Care of Lou from Lou's Retro Source. As usual, I'm just going to skim through these. And if you want to watch all of the details about anything that I talk about, please check out Lou's video and of course, subscribe to his channel. First up, Pierco started documenting the kick and run arcade schematics, which is a soccer game by Taito. The Crazy Blocks Arcade Core has now been officially released. If that was something that you were interested in, just run update now or whatever your updater script is to get it. Robert has uh, updated a few bugs on the PlayStation Core, uh, which and also had posted another really awesome write-up on Patreon. I know I say that every week, but honestly, I, I read them all. I'm not smart enough to understand them all, but they're, they're written in a way where at least I understand the concepts of what he's talking about. So uh, if you're into that, definitely subscribe. Also, the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle core is pretty far along, and Furtech has wanted to release the core now for, or had wanted to release the core for New Year's, but there's still some bugs that needed to be fixed before that could happen. My very strong opinion on this is Furtech, take, take your time. We're all here to support you. We'd love your work. When it's ready when it's ready, but I'm, I'm very excited to play that game. Uh, you know, I, I don't, I don't remember if I played it even on emulation. I think the last couple of times I played it was in the arcade game, both as a, a kid and, you know, recently whenever I've seen them in barcades. So that's going to be a lot of fun. 
Uh, next, Hotego released a beta core for the arcade game Extermination, which is a vertically scrolling arcade shooter released by Taito. So as always, you know, if you want access to the beta, you got to be a Patreon subscriber, but everything Hotego does is released publicly. So if you're not in a position to support, that's cool. Also, Hotego is going to be working on more Konami arcade games, thanks to all of the research that Furtech did with Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. So that's going to be pretty cool seeing even more of the Konami games come to Mr. Also, you don't uh, you no longer need to map the GunCon 2 buttons when loading cores. Thanks to Mr. Add-ons, Pork, the mappings are now added to the Mr.'s game controller database. Just update your Mr. to obtain these mappings, but you would still need to delete any old mappings that you had created. Mr. Add-ons is also working on mappings for the GunCon 3. Maybe this was the issue I had with mine. I watched Lou's video on it, I followed it to the T, but I still had issues with some cores, but not others. So I think maybe I should just go in and delete all of those mappings and try again with the GunCon 2 that I have. I have an official one and a knockoff one, so I'm gonna try them both as well, just to see. Um, and there was also some updates to the TurboGrafx-16 and Game Boy cores with more details here if you need it. So as always, thanks so much to Lou. I would never be able to keep up with all of this stuff without him. Uh, so, and also please check out his channel if you want analog pocket updates and just a bunch of other awesome videos. It is once again time for Sega Extreme's Sega Saturn game competition this year, celebrating the 28th anniversary of the Saturn. And this was something that I really dug into last year. I remember seeing it happen in 2019, but when the Shiro crew started helping out with Retro RGB, it got me even more excited about this competition. And uh, we'd talked a lot about them and stuff like that. So this is now the, the next continuation of it. And I just can't really wait to see what people have come up with here. Um, the Shiro crew did an amazing post that's kind of showing all of the stuff in each category of games that are coming through. Uh, and there's also some good videos and documentation on it. So I'm very, very excited to see how this year kind of fleshes out and to see what other cool stuff we have. But last year was a big one, but the developers that are working on this stuff are just awesome and always have something new and, and pretty crazy to, uh, to show us so please if you're interested check out the shiro post and we'll of course keep everybody updated and show everybody all of the videos and have a, a great summary on it as soon as it's released and everything so uh, definitely check out this year's submissions and of course we'll, we'll follow up when the contest is over but another awesome year it looks like all right lastly we have a review of a 10 in three out scart switch if you don't really care about this, I'll give a very short overview and then I'll let you know when the deep dive review starts. But if you don't care, you could drop off. Uh, there's nothing important after this. But this is a switch that's under 100 bucks, 10 inputs, three simultaneous outputs. It's safe to use all three. It comes with a USB cable, no USB charger, but that makes sense. It's why, why bundle international chargers? We all have spare cell phone chargers. And two SCART cables that do not suck. The only problem I found with it is the SCART outputs have left and right audio reversed, at least on the one that I tested. But other than that, it seems perfectly safe. It works really well. It's a good price and it's available from the Otaku Games AliExpress store. Now, I don't really know the full story about what happened with their main store. I've heard a bunch of people say they never got their switches or some people got them eventually. I know that there was a PayPal issue and anybody who's run a business that's had a PayPal issue knows that that should be criminal how they, they treat their customers sometimes. So I don't know enough to comment about any of that. I just know that if you get it through AliExpress, they should ship right away. And AliExpress does have some protection if it doesn't. So you could just go right ahead and, and pick this one up um, from there, not their other store if you need to. So let's dig into the review now. But once again, I do not want to waste anybody's time. If you don't care, just drop off. There's nothing important now. But if you're somebody who reviews SCART switches or if you have an interesting and unique setup and you're not sure if this one's for you, definitely stick with me. So the first thing to mention, as soon as I had finished the live stream, a bunch of people reached out to say that the switch that they have has four yellow components under each SCART receptacle, not three. So uh, that means that for better or worse, the one that I tested might be different than the one you receive, which is always interesting to see. Um, you know, I always like to see obviously revision updates and, and, and bugs fixed, but uh, I just 
respectfully have to say that anything that I say only applies to the exact one that I tested. And if yours is uh, any different, you might want to at least just pick up one of those cheap $30 scopes so you know for sure that it's a safe one to use. Uh, but moving on, this switch will only accept and pass through RGB SCART. RGB, or RGBS through the SCART port. So I mentioned that because the SCART standard allows for composite video to be passed through as well as S video. And many of us in the retro gaming world sometimes pass component video through SCART just to use one switch for everything. This one will only pass RGB signals through. It won't pass composite video, it won't pass composite as sync. However, it will accept all different forms of sync. So basically, if your cable is built properly, doesn't matter if it's sync on C-Sync, sync on composite video, sync on Luma, whatever, this will accept it and it will make sure that it only outputs C-Sync. So that's one of the other reasons why you can't just run composite video over sync and then take that out. There is no way to turn the sync stripping off. However, it seems to work really well. Now, it is not magic, it is not sync regeneration, so it's not going to fix things like master system on those odd model BVMs. Uh, you're going to have to go to the GSCART for something like that. But it did seem to be safe to use. And in fact, I threw a couple of different crazy scenarios at it. Like I got your standard cable, uh, which was outputting 644 millivolts. And this switch outputted 868, which is still totally safe. But I put kind of a higher voltage through it. I put 1.19 volts into it and it outputted 728. It dropped the sync to the proper level. So whatever sync circuit that they're using appears to be fine. Now, that doesn't mean that it's indestructible. If you put high voltage sync through it that you're not supposed to ever put through a SCART connector, who knows if it'll survive, but that's not the switch's problem. Respectfully, that's your problem. So as long as you put well-made cables through it, you know, no, no junk cables, you should be totally fine. The switch has three outputs that could all be used simultaneously. Two RGB SCART outputs and RGBS broken out to RCA connectors. So just to be very clear though, all of the outputs on this is just RGBS. Just because you see RCA connectors here does not mean that there is component video. They're just breaking it out. My assumption is for devices like RGB monitors. So now you could just use some RCA cables and some very cheap RCA to BNC adapters to connect this to any one of your RGB monitors or maybe a different Extron device if that's what you need to use. And it also has a 3.5 millimeter audio jack and two RCA audio jacks on the side. And uh, sync is all the way on the end. Not sure why it wasn't next to RGB, but whatever. Um, now also, don't be fooled. The the labeling on here, the 3.5 millimeter jack is labeled to phones. It's not a headphone jack, it's a line level out. And sync out is a yellow connector, but it's not composite video, it's just sync. So three outputs that you could use simultaneously. I plugged multiple things in and the voltage didn't change on the other outputs, so it should be buffered correctly. Now, as for quality, the video output was fine. It um, There was a slight bit of difference when I had to set phase. I couldn't set it as easily. And there seemed to be a hair of ringing if you zoom in a thousand percent. But generally speaking, for a hundred dollar 10 in, three out switch, be, the video is fine. And you're really not going to notice it during gameplay in your setup. At least I certainly wouldn't in the context of me playing. Maybe if uh, your setup is going to be a little bit different, just know that it's not as good as direct plugging it in, but I don't think it's a problem. The only time it might be a problem is if you're doing a deep dive analysis of video signals, but if you were doing that, you wouldn't put it through any switch anyway. You would always go direct into whatever device you're using. So I would call the video output very good on this one. Um, also, the brightness levels were good, which you could see both by the side-by-side -side shot and also with an oscilloscope. I only put one reading on here because it was identical. It would have just been the same, the same signal twice. Um, so that's good. The audio output, the quality is good, but they reversed the left and right channels on the SCART output, which is, you know, that's a mistake I would make. I'm not going to lie. That's they, they got all the really hard stuff right, and they, they massively screwed up an easy one. It's totally a, a Bob mistake to make. Anybody that watches my live streams <laughs> so has seen that happen a lot. So 
if you're doing something like going into a PVM or if you or, or if your video is going into a scaler uh, or you know an RGB monitor, but your audio is coming out of the RCA jacks into a stereo, it's not going to matter at all. But if you're going from something like a SCART cable directly into a RetroTINK 5X or an OSSC or something, that's going to be a problem because you can't really swap the audio there. So you would have to do something like open up the SCART head. You would want to label this too, yeah, like a silver Sharpie, and take the, the side that you're going to use as output and swap the left and right cables on just one side. Because remember, if you swap them on both sides, it's going back to the way it was. And then just label a switch, input, output, and stuff like that. And, or not the switch, the SCART heads. Um, so that's an easy way around it if you're comfortable just soldering two tiny little wires and a SCART head. It comes with two cables. I'll get to those in a second. So that's kind of annoying. But, you know, for what you're getting for the money here, you might still just overlook that, especially if you're using audio outputs the other way. Now, I did MD Fourier test this. As, of course I did. You know, I, I love that software. So... Uh, what I did was I took a Genesis 3 that had a triple bypass and I used a SCART to BNC breakout that also has RCA and I went into my MD Fourier approved Motu M4 on a Mac to make sure I get the cleanest audio through it. And I recorded the MD Fourier test pattern twice direct. And then I compared that to itself in MD Fourier just to show you that you will always get interference when you're doing analog audio. Uh, there's always going to be some differences no matter what. That's just how analog audio works. So then I took the same SCART to BNC adapter and I used a fully shielded coax cable to go from the SCART outputs into the Motu. And that's when I discovered the lines were reversed. So I just took the breakout cable and swapped the left and right channels there. And then I ran the test with both SCART outputs. And then I ran the test also from the RCA outputs and the 3.5 millimeter jack. And the differences between going direct into the Motu versus through the switch were about the same differences as just the two direct connections. So that means that this thing adds little to no interference or noise or hum on the lines. So basically, other than the audio swap issue on the SCART outputs, the audio quality is good on this. As for auto switching, this will automatically output whatever input it detects the latest. So it, when I was using one console, I had it plugged in, I plugged in a second console and turned that on and it switched to it. Now, you should never have multiple consoles powered on at the same time. And when I did do that, there did not seem to be a voltage different using the oscilloscope. The voltage didn't seem to bleed into each other's SCART ports. Uh, I had a hard, uh, that's a little harder to test when you actually have stuff plugged into it, but it seemed fine, but I did get a slow rolling dim black bar going from the top to the bottom. Now, I just, I'm saying that both to remind you to not power on multiple consoles at the same time when you're using a switch, but also just to say, you know, in my personal opinion, that's not a big deal. If you have one console plugged on, pl powered on at a time, the switch works great. If you use it improperly, it doesn't work great, but you're using it improperly. So if you're somebody who like, you're running a speed run on a console, but you just leave it paused, and you wanna go play another game on another console for a while and then come back, that that's not gonna work for you then. Uh, you might, or you would have to unplug something, the SCART cable, the AV port, whatever. <clears throat> but for anybody's normal use, that should be completely and totally fine. The auto switching should work fine. So just wanted to mention it. Now, if you're using a scaler, like a RetroTINK or an OSSC, or you're going into an RGB monitor or some kind of processor, you don't even have to listen to this next section, but, um, or, or you might want to anyway just for informational purposes. However, if you have something like a PAL CRT with a SCART port in it, then this may have issues. So on a SCART port, pin 8 is supposed to be 10 volts, and that sets the aspect ratio. And pin 16 is supposed to be 2 volts. I think those voltages are correct. Please correct me if I'm wrong. <clears throat> and that pin 16 is supposed to tell the TV if the cable is in RGB or composite mode. And this was because those TVs have multiple, you know, if you have an RGB SCART input on your CRT, that format supports composite or RGB, but how would it know which one to use? 
you could manually go into your CRT sometimes and switch inputs, but just having the voltage there is an easy way to, to decipher that. So this switch outputs five volts on both pins, which I assume is a result of the USB power. It's probably not connecting voltage from your SCAR inputs and only using its power circuit to, to save the routing of the switch. That's a guess, by the way, but that's what I would do if I were building this. And the person who sent me this switch, who, by the way, this switch was donated to the community, uh, drop shipped to me by somebody who just wanted a deep dive review. So you're all awesome. Thank you so much. But the person also bought one for themselves. They tested it on their SCART CRT and said that it switched everything perfectly. So maybe your TV will work, maybe it won't, but I don't think there's any safety issue whatsoever using it this way. Please let me know if you know different. I only have one PAL CRT and it's super compatible with everything. Um, we, we, it has an RGB SCART port and I just never have any of these voltage issues. So I'm really gonna have to rely on the community to help out with this one but I think you'll be fine. But once again, it says nothing to do with retro tanks or RGB monitors or anything like that. Speaking of the USB power, it uses a USB A port for power, which is against the USB standard. And it's just weird. I just, I see that a lot in products from Asia, never from North America or Europe. So I don't really understand why they would have chosen that. And it's not a problem if you use the cable they ship it with and you use a decent charger, you'll never have an issue with this. However, how many of you have extra USB A to A cables laying around? Okay, how many of you have extra USB micro or USB uh, or mini USB or USB C cables laying around? Probably all of us. So that was just a weird choice. I wish they used USB C or even just old school USB A to B like old devices had, but not a problem. It's just a strange thing I wanted to mention. Also, fun little bonus, the cables that were bundled with this switch don't suck. And, you know, finding good SCAR cables is not easy. 99% of the ones that I have tested are garbage, which is why it's so exciting to find one that just performs totally fine. It didn't seem to be fully shielded coax. However, when I ran the same Super Mario World test, on a fully shielded coax cable going from the output of the switch directly into an OSSC and their cable it performed the same. Same thing with MD Fourier. You, uh, fully shielded cable versus theirs performed very close. And once again, the differences were basically like when I did direct to direct. So fun bonus, you know, it comes with two SCART cables uh, that you could totally feel free using. Once again, if you're doing a deep dive video signal analysis, you might want to just plug it in direct anyway. But for gaming, those car cables seemed fine. And they certainly didn't add buzz or hum because MD Fourier would have picked up on that. So overall, I liked the switch a lot. I think it was really worth the, you know, the, the money for it. I think if you pay for it, you just have to come to terms with the fact that the SCART output reverses left and right audio. If you're a tinkerer, maybe you could try to, to cut some traces and rewire. I, I don't know. I would rather do that in the cable, but over, I mean, I guess I say that, but if you fix it on the switch, you don't have to worry about the next person who gets that switch. I do admit though, I'm always biased when it comes to SCART switches because Super G's G-SCART switch has been out forever and we have beat the ever living crap out of it. You know, so many of us have brought it to different events and thrown it in our backpacks. And, you know, I, I am unplugging and plugging stuff into it and jamming probes into it, measuring stuff. And it just, it's consistently made well. And it always takes a beating and it has a ton of extra features and it's very expensive. So if you're just looking for the best, that's you, you just rely on it. It'll pass whatever you need. It's got a ton of extra features. The G-SCART switch is still the one that you're going to want to go to but it's three times the price of this. So if you're like, look, I just need to switch. I want an auto switch. I don't care that it doesn't pass composite video. I just want RGB through it. And oh, by the way, I'm plugging this into a stereo anyway, so I can grab the audio from the RCA ports. This is the one to get. So I liked it. I hope that, uh, I hope that they, can, uh, they stay consistent on the revs. I hope they fix the audio output and then just kind of leave it alone because it's performed well 
and it would just make me nervous to continue to see more revisions with large changes in it. So hopefully they've, they've kind of nailed this one down. If you want to see more details on this, I embedded the live stream in here. This 15, 20 minute review that I'm doing here is everything that you need to know. But if you want to test this stuff yourself, or if you're just a fellow nerd and you want to listen to us talk and be silly, then you know definitely check out the stream. But honestly, what I've said here is everything you need to know. And I had to do all the md 4 e testing after the fact, because I can't really do it on Windows. And there's a whole big, I got to figure out a better way to md 4 e test during live streams. Maybe I got to just have a second computer here for that dedicated just for that use. But either way, uh, hopefully you enjoyed all of this stuff. Um, you know, hopefully this was a help because this was like a full between the live stream, writing this up, the MD4 a testing. This was like a, a full day's worth of work to test this switch. So uh, if you want it, the link is right here. And uh, if anything about this, were, you know, was like, oh, I wanted to pass composite video. I, I need left and right. Fine. And I don't know how to change the head of a SCART cable or something, then, you know, maybe this one isn't for you. But I do like choices and this one's up there with some of the better ones I've tested. Well, that's it for this week. Hopefully you're still here with me after two very long <laughs> ranty reviews um, or you just skipped through it and didn't waste your time. But either way, if you're still here, thank you very much. I so appreciate your time and that you listen to this and that you're enthusiastic about the community and are into this stuff just kind of like we all are. But as always, thank you for everybody who watches, listens, plays nicely in the comments and especially people who support because without you, none of this would happen, especially not a deep dive SCART switch live stream and, and deep review like this. It is only you that allows this to happen. So thank you all so much, and I'll see you all next week.